I have been a palliative care nurse practitioner for more than 30 years and a nurse scientist in palliative care for more than 20 years. And the focus of my research has been on dyspnea and I've also done some small studies uh, with death rattle. And so I'm extremely pleased and flattered that your planning committee sought to let me participate in the conference by being in Hong Kong virtually, but yet still in my study in the USA. So let's talk about dyspnea. And by definition, it's the person's own personal awareness of uncomfortable or distressing breathing. So we can't look at a person and say they're dyspneic. We can only detect dyspnea, also known as breathlessness, when a patient gives us that symptom report. On the other hand, for our patients who are at the end of life, often they lose the ability to tell us what their symptoms are. And so we can use the term respiratory distress when we're describing the observed corollary to dyspnea. So respiratory distress is observing the physical and emotional signs that might be associated with respiratory dysregulation. And throughout this talk, I will not use these terms interchangeably. Dyspnea is, I'm only gonna use the term dyspnea when I'm referring to a patient self-report I'm only gonna use the term respiratory distress when I'm suggesting that we're observing this phenomenon. So to review the pathophysiology, this is a phylogenetically ancient response. When species first moved from water to air breathing, there was an evolutionary development of areas in the brain to respond to when there wasn't sufficient air. So I'm gonna use the term asphyxial threat to refer to when there is one or more of a blood gas abnormality or an airflow alteration or stretch receptor dysregulation in the lungs. So in other words, if the patient becomes hypoxemic, hypercarbic, has obstructive or restrictive airflow, or has a, an anatomical dis receptor dysregulation in the lung, that will produce the asphyxial threat. And when there is an asphyxial threat, then there are redundant brain areas that are activated to respond to that threat. So at the highest brain level, the cerebral cortex, this is where the awareness of altered breathing comes in. But that can be positive or negative. For example, if I'm a marathon runner and I get to the 20 mile mark and now I'm feeling that my breathing is a little short, I'm not gonna view that negatively because I'm gonna know it's from exercise and I'm gonna know that once I resume normal resting state, that shortness of breath is gonna go away. But for our patients, who have altered breathing, even something as simple as a flight of stairs for a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease could cause them to be short of breath. And it becomes a negative awareness because they don't know if that is going to abate when they go back to a resting state. In addition to the person's awareness of altered breathing, there's an activation of the amygdala, which is nuclei in the temporal lobe at the subcortical level that produces emotional reactivity. And in the case of a threat to survival, in this case, the asphyxial threat, the amygdala is activated, which produces what patients will sometimes refer to as suffocation fear. And then lastly, in the most primitive part of the brain, the brain stem, activation of the brain stem is towards survival. And so the pulmonary stress behaviors you see listed on the slide are a means of trying to compensate for the asphyxial threat. Now I'm gonna come back to some of these brain activations in a little bit and you'll see why. This is. This is a tease. I'm going to show you some more things about this shortly. So here's a cross section of the brain and the amygdala are not in the cortex, the high functioning areas, but in the limbic part of the brain or the emotional part of the brain. 
So let's talk about who gets dyspneic at the end of life. Solano did this um, systematic review a number of years ago now, and she looked at a number of major symptoms, including dyspnea, across the five terminal illnesses that you see in the left column. I pulled from her paper to construct this table just to show the prevalence of dyspnea. So as you can see, the left column are the diagnoses, then we have prevalence, the number of studies in her systematic review, and then the aggregate sample size in those studies. And just at a glance, you can see that we know a great deal more about dyspnea in cancer than we do in the other conditions. And we look at cancer, you see a spread in the prevalence of 10 to 70%. I would estimate from the systematic review that the 70% prevalence were patients closer to the end of life and with lung cancer. And the lower prevalence were patients who were probably not close to death and perhaps had other cancers such as GI cancers. As expected, you can see the higher prevalences in heart disease and COPD, and that, that is no surprise. Now, there are some gaps in this prevalence data. Patients who cannot self-report are either excluded from studies or dropped from longitudinal studies once they lose the ability to give a symptom self-report. And for patients who enroll in hospice, many of those patients have lost the ability to self-report. So there seems to be a gap in our evidence about what is happening for patients who are closest to dying when these prevalence studies exclude them. Another gap in the evidence in prevalence studies is sometimes proxy reports are used from either clinicians or family caregivers and proxy reports we know can be unreliable. A family member who's very emotional might worry that the patient is in distress when in fact the patient is not showing us any signs of distress. So that would be an overestimation. And clinicians, there's a number of studies that show that nurses and physicians overlook patient symptoms when the patient doesn't give us a symptom self-report. And furthermore, the Solano study, as good as it was, didn't include all the conditions that might result in patient death. David Corot is a very prolific palliative care researcher in Australia, and he looked at the trajectory of dyspnea. So we've moved from prevalence now to what is the course as the patient goes from advanced disease to terminal disease to end of life? And so with this important study, he looked at a large number of patients who were enrolled in hospice. And at every clinical encounter, meaning every time a hospice nurse saw the patient, they measured the patient's numeric rating of their dyspnea. And they followed these patients who were at the highest risk of developing dyspnea. So those with primary or secondary lung cancer, heart failure, and COPD. And they looked at three time points before death, two months, one month, and one week. And they found, as expected, dyspnea was highest in non-cancer patients at all time points. But here's an important thought if you're taking care of patients with cancer, dyspnea will increase significantly in cancer and most of those increases are gonna be seen in the last two weeks. Now, a limitation of David's study is that they didn't follow patients till death if they couldn't self-report and they used proxy reports, which I've already suggested can be unreliable. So, somebody had to bridge the gap in what we didn't learn from David's study, which is what is happening with the non-self-reporting patient in that last period of time when many patients start to have cognitive impairment and can no longer tell us what their symptoms are. 
well, that's somebody who is me. <laughs> so I undertook this study to extend what David's study showed us, but to look much more closely at that non-self-reporting patient. So I did a longitudinal repeated measure study, all patients from a single hospice, but I didn't look at just patients at high risk for dyspnea. I was interested in knowing what happens to any diagnosis. And so at, just like in David's study, at every hospice nurse clinical encounter, dyspnea was measured using a numeric rating scale or respiratory distress, if the patient couldn't self-report, using the respiratory distress observation scale, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit, consciousness using the reaction level scale, and performance using the palliative performance scale. And then we analyzed the data backward from day of death to one month before death. So what this line graph shows you Starting the, the x-axis at the bottom is from 30 days moving left to right until we get to the day of death. And the y-axis, the vertical axis, is from 0 to 10. We truncated it at 6, but from 0 to 10 would be the uh, palliative performance scale, which is really 10 to 100, but to make one scale for all three of these measures, I, I modified the scale. Now, if you follow the blue line, which is respiratory distress, at 30 days before death, on the respiratory distress observation scale, patients were not in distress. On the RDOS, scores between zero and two is no distress. But as you see, and we move along to about day six, we start to see an increase. And by day of death, the RDOS score across diagnoses is now in the four to six range, which is moderate respiratory distress. Now, why is that helpful? Well, it's not terribly helpful because we don't know with certainty when a patient is gonna die. But by looking at these other two measures, consciousness and functional performance, we can start to get a sense of when the patient is in the last week. So consciousness decreases and starts to seriously decrease around day four or five. And the red line is, I'm sorry, that was functional performance. The red line is consciousness, which is pretty high functioning, again, until just about that same five, six days. You can see a nexus here of, and I don't know if my, right around here, day six is when all these things come together. So what I suggest this means for clinical application is when the patient starts to decrease consciousness and decrease functional performance, that's the time when we need to be more vigilant about monitoring them for respiratory distress because there's a likelihood of escalation of their distress in the last week. So why do I emphasize so much about respiratory distress instead of measuring dyspnea? It's for this reason. There are cognitive skills necessary for symptom reporting. So the patient has to interpret the stimuli and tell you, is this pain, is this shortness of breath, is this nausea? They need to pay attention to our instructions and concentrate to form a report. So am I gonna ask them a yes or no question? Am I gonna ask them a numeric rating? They need to understand and think about their sensory stimulus and then how I want them to report it. They need to be able to communicate. Now that might be verbal, it might be nodding their head. It might be pointing to a place on a line. And if we're trending their symptom, they need to remember what they told you before treatment so that you, they can tell you after treatment how that symptom is responding. Now, these seem pretty obvious and pretty simple, but we're all fully cognitively intact. Add into the mix 
metabolic derangements, hypoxemia, illness severity, etc. And these cognitive skills begin to lose their function. But while the patient can give us a symptom self-report, I recommend one of the th three of these four bulleted items as the common dyspnea assessment tools. So first is a simple yes or no query. Are you short of breath? That is unidimensional and it's a simple screen, but it might be all the patient can do. If they can answer yes or no, you might attempt to use a pneumatic a numeric rating system anchored from zero, no shortness of breath, to 10, worst ever shortness of breath. Or you can use a visual analog scale, which is a vertical or horizontal line anchored from, usually for dyspnea, it's anchored at zero to 100 millimeters. And the patient points to the place on the line. Patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease might be familiar with the Borg scale if they have been in a pulmonary rehabilitation program. I don't recommend the Borg scale for palliative care because it's valid for dyspnea after exercise. And I don't think you're getting your hospice patients up on a treadmill. So I recommend starting with the simplest, yes or no, and then using one or the other of the numeric rating or the visual analog scale to get uh, an intensity from the patient. Here's an example of a dyspnea visual analog scale. And you note that it's vertical. Uh, Dr. Audrey Gift, a number of years ago, with a sample of COPD patients, identified that a vertical scale was preferred by patients. And so the anchor here is distress, no distress, worst distress. And the patient points to one of these points on the line, and then we can count and say, well, it's a 30, now it's 50, now it's 20, etc. Now, what about our patients who are close to passing and can no longer report dyspnea? This is from one of my studies. I wanted to quantify how few patients near death are able to do a dyspnea report. And so I used a sample of people at high risk, COPD, heart failure, lung cancer, and pneumonia. And we asked them two questions. Are you short of breath? Yes, no. And if they could answer yes, no, then we had them point to a dyspnea visual analog scale. We also measured their consciousness, nearness to death, and demographics. So we found that of this sample, more than half could not answer yes or no. And of those that could answer, half of those could not use the visual analog scale. And as expected, it was because of decreased consciousness and nearness to death. But it's a relatively large number So what does that mean then? How will we know if our patients are short of breath when they can't tell us? So let's go back to that redundant brain areas I talked about. This is a model of respiratory distress. If there is an asphyxial threat, one or more of hypercarbia, hypoxemia, or inspiratory effort, the most immediate brain area activated is the brain stem, producing those pulmonary stress behaviors I showed you a few minutes ago. And not too quickly, somewhat quickly after activation of the brain stem is activation of the amygdala, producing an array of responses associated with fear. Now, if these brain areas are universal to species that breathe air, then the behaviors are also going to be universal behaviors. And if we take these behaviors, perhaps we can construct an observation scale that permits clinical evaluation of the patient who cannot give a symptom self-report. 
and that's exactly what I have done. So this is the respiratory distress observation scale. It is the only known scale for the assessment of respiratory distress when a patient cannot give a dyspnea self-report. And if I sound like I'm very proud of this scale, I am very proud of this scale. We developed this a number of years ago. It's been in the literature for more than 10 years. I'm pleased to report that in the United States, it's in clinical use in more than 60 clinical sites, but it's also in use in 11 countries and has been translated into seven languages. So let me show you this version. This is courtesy of Professor Yuju Chen, a professor of nursing in Taiwan, uh, who I met a number of years ago and collaborated her on this translation. But since I don't read Chinese, I'm going to go back a slide and walk you through what the instrument shows. So each of those variables in the left column come from brain activation when there's an asphyxial threat. And each of those variables is scored zero to two points, depending on the normalcy of the variable or difficulty. And you'll note that paradoxical breathing, grunting at end expiration, nasal flaring, and a fearful facial display get zero points if they're absent, but two points if they're present. And the reason for that is in the study that we did to develop the scale, we found those four variables were present when the patient was in severe respiratory distress, hence the weighting with two points. So a clinician scores each of the variables by observing the patient, counting the heart rate, counting the respiratory rate, and then we add the, the totals together and we get a scale score that ranges between zero and 16, with obviously zero being none and 16 being the highest possible score. So here it is again in Chinese. And here is an illustration of what a fearful facial display looks like in a Caucasian person. Um, eyes wide open, bright eyebrows raised, mouth open, teeth together. And in this picture, you can actually see the nasal flaring as well. And we've established cut points to the RDOS. Scores zero to two, the patient is not in distress. Three is mild, four to six represents moderate, and seven or higher is severe distress. So our comfort goal for our patients in hospice care would be to try to keep their scores at three or less. It is not always possible to completely reduce this complex symptom. So a score of three might be as best we can do. So, now let's talk about dyspnea treatment with all of that background in prevalence and assessment and introducing scales. So dyspnea treatment begins with identification if there are any disease modifying treatments that might be consistent with goals of care and or patients nearness to death. So draining an ascites, tapping a pleural effusion, diuresing for heart failure could all be helpful to reducing the patient's dyspnea. Similarly, treating infection. The most reliable way to treat dyspnea from breathing failure is mechanical ventilation. However, that may not be goal concordant because we know the burden of ventilation. For patients with chronic dyspnea from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or heart failure, maintaining their supportive treatments until the patient is unconscious and very close to passing is a good standard to consider. Why, why, um, why, 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 Are we okay? Can you still hear me all right? Should I continue? I just heard a, a voice. I'm gonna assume I should continue. So uh, 
bronchodilators, as I mentioned before we had the tech, while we were still having technical difficulties, when I share with you evidence, I'm going to categorize them as recommended for practice or likely to be effective or balance benefit with harm or not effective. So bronchodilators, especially the long acting agents, are recommended for practice if your patient has COPD and is in hospice. And we wanna continue them through their illness trajectory at least until the patient is unconscious. But managing a, a meter dose inhaler can become more complex as the patient's functional performance declines. So changing to an aerosol treatment is appropriate. The short acting drugs also can be effective, but on a more, uh, um, a more um, see it's, it's the end of the day for me and I've lost my words, on a more regular kind of schedule. What we don't know is, is there a role for bronchodilators when there are other causes of dyspnea? Opioids are the major pharmacologic strategy that has an evidence base for treating opioid, or for, for treating uh, dyspnea, excuse me. And the way it works is changing the oxygen and carbon dioxide threshold in the brain. So another way to think about that is opioids are tricking the brain into not recognizing hypoxemia and hypercarbia. And this has been illustrated through a number of studies that I've referenced for you on the slide where they took healthy volunteers, induced dyspnea, and did neuroimaging, brain imaging, to detect that there's an altered central perception. So opioids, specifically morphine, has the largest evidence, is recommended for practice, particularly the, oral, uh, the immediate release form, and most of the studies were with patients with cancer and COPD. Likely to be effective are the sustained release once daily morphine, and this comes out of David Carreau's work in Australia. Um, in the US, David Huey's work has looked at subcutaneous morphine in lung cancer. These have been small studies, but the evidence is pointing in a positive direction. Effectiveness has not been established for immediate release morphine in interstitial lung disease like pulmonary fibrosis. Nebulized fentanyl has not been established as effective and oral transmucosal fentanyl has not had effectiveness established. This doesn't mean these drugs don't or won't work. It means there hasn't been a powered large sample of a rigorous research design. Now, if anyone participating in this conference is looking for a research project, <laughs> These are, there are gonna be a many things I'm gonna show you in this session that would lend themselves very nicely to a research project, particularly the use of the nebulized fentanyl or the oral transmucosal fentanyl, because as patients get closer and closer to passing and have difficulty swallowing, it'd be nice if we could establish effectiveness of these routes. With regard to doses, across dose studies of opioids for dyspnea, there is high variability. And again, this is an area of needed research. But here's the approach I recommend based on what we do know and based on many years of my own personal experience treating patients. Begin with an immediate release formulation. So that might be five milligrams if it's an oral drug or two milligrams if it's parenteral. Readminister every 30 minutes for oral or every 15 minutes for parenteral until the patient has relief. And the titration doses for the repeat drug could be 50 or 100% of the initial dose. Then calculate the total dose, dose given and prescribe accordingly as an around the clock every three to four hour dose and then prescribe for breakthrough. If the patient's dyspnea is episodic, then prescribe it on an as needed schedule. <laughs>
The adverse effects of opioids are the same as when we administer them for pain. Constipation never abates. And if your patient is going to be started on a chronic morphine dose, then you'll obviously need to start them on a bowel regimen. Nausea and vomiting generally abates in a few days. Sedation is usually a sign that the dose may be a little too high. Respiratory depression, the thing that most clinicians and some patients are very afraid of, was not seen in any of the 18 studies in Jennings Cochrane Review and not seen in David Carreau's safety studies. So unfortunately, there is a phenomenon around the world in opi called opiophobia, where clinicians are afraid to give morphine when a patient has dyspnea because of fear of causing respiratory depression. The fear of causing depression is in excess of the reality. Here are the gaps in our opioid evidence. Does hydromorphone, hydrocodone, or methadone work as well as morphine? We don't know. It, those, have not, those agents have not been studied. Likewise, as I already mentioned, it'd be nice if we had some drug delivery studies using the transmucosal or transdermal routes. And most all of the study about opioids for dyspnea has been done in cancer and in COPD. So we need to look at other patients who have a high prevalence of developing dyspnea. What about benzodiazepines? As we know, those are sedatives. Their indication is for sleep disturbance and anxiety. In a Cochrane review, Simon reviewed seven studies that were either randomized controlled trials or controlled trials and found no significant effect for relief and no significant effect as breakthrough. So with regard to benzodiazepine evidence, the effectiveness is not established. Um, the, the studies had mixed diagnoses, mixed results, and we know these drugs have more adverse events, such as sedation and falls. Further gaps in the evidence, lorazepam is the most commonly used benzodiazepine, but wasn't studied. And we still need to know if benzodiazepines have a role as an adjunct to opioids. To date, there's only been one study by Navaganti where he looked at midazolam as an adjunct to morphine. And these were patients with advanced cancer. So in group one, around the clock morphine with midazolam for breakthrough. In group two, around the clock midazolam with morphine for breakthrough. And group three, around the clock morphine and midazolam with morphine rescue. And the group three had the best overall results. But to date, one study, one study is not make an evidence base. So let me go back to this for a minute. When I was in practice, I thought that adding a benzodiazepine as an adjunct was helpful when the patient had dyspnea that was largely controlled with morphine, but had anxiety about the dyspnea coming back, had anxiety compromising their relief from the opioid. And I found that really low doses, such as lorazepam 0.5 milligrams Q6 hours was sufficient to control the anxiety without sedating the patient as an adjunct to an opioid. So as a general rule, if non-pharmacological measures aren't relieving the dyspnea and you introduce morphine, don't automatically introduce a benzodiazepine unless you have a strong indication that there's a high anxiety component because the, the two medications together could lead to uh, adverse events. So let's talk about oxygen. So we know that it corrects hypoxemia, and if dyspnea is produced because of hypoxemia, then it makes every bit of sense to give oxygen. 
It's long been believed that in COPD patients, long-term oxygen prolonged survival. But this study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, was a randomized control trial that looked at long-term oxygen for patients with COPD. And you see that they measured time to death, rate of hospitalizations, exacerbations, quality of life, and performance on a six-minute walk test. And what they found in this large randomized controlled trial was no difference. So <clears throat> we, we have to rethink our standard of care in patients with advanced COPD and whether or not they need long-term oxygen. Now you can see that the picture in this slide is dated. Look at that big tank that <clears throat> this man has between his legs. Nowadays, I've seen people on flights that have nasal oxygen and I can't even see where their compressor is because they've been reduced to such small size. <clears throat> Excuse me. So while oxygen is ubiquitous, common, easy to use, relatively benign, it is not completely free of burdens. So patients are tethered. Um, if we are putting their, delivering their supplemental oxygen by mask, they may often feel suffocated. The environment around flowing oxygen is more flammable. And if your patient is still smoking, that can cause serious adverse consequences. And furthermore, if the patient is actively dying, and may or may not have any distress by continuing to apply oxygen. Are we extending caregiver days by prolonging dying? Are we increasing healthcare costs? And I also want to call out something all of you may have learned in your physiology courses, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. An O2 saturation at 85% corresponds with a PO2 of 60. And you'll see a flattening of the curve when you get to the higher PO2s and the higher saturations. So an overuse of oxygen might be because we've forgotten our physiology and that the patient is pretty well saturated at 85%. So what about oxygen evidence? It is recommended for practice in patients with hypoxemia. The effectiveness has not been established in cancer patients without hypoxemia. And in my study, effectiveness is unlikely in patients who are near death as long as there are no signs of respiratory distress. It's not recommended to routinely provide oxygen, particularly if the patient is not hypoxemic. So let's talk about what I hope you will consider as an oxygen use guideline. Patient has dyspnea or respiratory distress and is hypoxemic. So an oxygen saturation less than 85%. Consider nasal cannula at two liters a minute, increase slowly if distress persists. Conversely, patient has dyspnea and is normally oxygenating. Oxygen will not be of benefit, but perhaps increasing the airflow will be helpful, so we might consider a fan. And if the patient can't be relieved by increasing airflow, then consider adding an opioid. Third case, patient has no signs of respiratory distress, and they're near death, regardless of what their oxygen saturation is. Remember that as a person is dying, their breathing slows, their gas exchange decreases. We probably should think about not measuring O2 saturation because I think there's a tendency when we measure it to want to elevate it. And when the patient is very close to passing and in no distress, it doesn't matter what their O2 saturation is. It is heading down to zero, in fact. So I would consider at that point discontinuing oxygen if it's in use, but stand by just in case to observe for distress. 
So gaps in our oxygen evidence, all the studies have been with COPD and lung cancer. We're missing out on what is the role for oxygen, if any, in these other conditions. Fans, on the other hand, oh, finally, something we can do for dyspnea that's non-farm, has no adverse effects, and is recommended for practice. Inexpensive, easy to use across diagnoses with a number of studies supporting their use. Now, the fan needs to be blowing on the face. There's a belief that activation of the trigeminal nerves in the face sends a corollary signal to the brain. And remember, dyspnea is happening in the brain. So there might be a resetting of the hypoxemia hypercarbia threshold by activating the trigeminal nerve. <clears throat> now, depending on where you live and if cool air can happen just by opening a window, that's even easier. What about high flow nasal oxygen? Well, this intervention has been helpful with flow delivery rates up to 60 liters a minute by increasing end expiratory lung volume and tidal volume delivered in the acute care setting. It evolved for stabilizing patients until an underlying etiology for hypoxemia could be resolved. So patients with potentially reversible illness. Now, we're starting to see in my country an explosion of use of high flow nasal oxygen for patients who have hypoxemia but don't have reversible disease. And so the questions that I ask is, what if we can't wean them to conventional oxygen or no oxygen, do they have to stay in the hospital and for how long? There's only been one study to look at high flow nasal oxygen in palliative care. And that's by David Huey, my colleague in the United States. So I rank this evidence as benefit balanced with harm. So the benefit is patients with cancer with persistent dyspnea from hypoxemia. But since high flow nasal oxygen cannot be universally provided outside the acute care setting, then that would be the harm. Patient can't leave the hospital. There are vendors who are evolving technologies to be able to deliver those high flow rates in the home setting. But as I said, it's not universal. Non-invasive ventilation. For the patient, especially the patient who's having a ventilation uh, disorder, who is hypercarbic, then non-invasive ventilation may be helpful. And we know the benefits of non-invasive ventilation as an option for patients who want to avoid invasive ventilation, or patients who have do not intubate preferences, but have potentially reversible respiratory failure. And a third important population is patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis who over time develop breathing failure because of lack of innervation to the diaphragm and the respiratory muscles. And those patients do have improved symptoms and longer survival. So there are benefits to non-invasive ventilation. But for every benefit, there are significant adverse effects. The most difficult is mask intolerance. And in fact, some patients will develop a pressure sore on the bridge of their nose. Also, there's anxiety, claustrophobia. They can't eat when they're wearing a mask. <clears throat> it's the communication is muffled and difficult. Quill and Quill, excuse me, <coughs> Quill and Quill gave us a very nice paper describing the benefits and burdens as a palliative intervention. One of the strongest benefits is postponing death a short time to achieve short-term patient goals. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, families traveling from a great distance. There's burdens, as you can see, listed here on the slide. <coughs> Pardon me. I should have a glass of water standing by. I wasn't expecting to give this lecture live. <clears throat> One of the challenges for adding 
a technology for the patient who's close to dying, is then we have to add the burden of decision making to withdraw it. <clears throat> so as with high flow nasal oxygen, I categorize non-invasive ventilation as benefit balanced with harm. There's only been one palliative care study, Stefano Nava in Italy did a study with cancer patients who had solid tumors and hypercarbia. And he did find evidence but, uh, for benefit. But 11% of the patients in his study had to discontinue because of mask intolerance, sleep disturbance, difficulty eating and speaking. So we don't know enough about non-invasive ventilation in a palliative care context, only one study. Pulmonary rehabilitation is recommended for practice if your patient has COPD. Long, large, robust body of evidence, even for patients with very low FEV1 levels. Now, what we don't know is how late in the disease can the patient still benefit from pulmonary rehabilitation. So depending on where you're seeing the patient with advanced COPD, if they haven't been enrolled in a pulmonary rehabilitation program, it might be something to consider. Okay, so that concludes a discussion about dyspnea, its prevalence, its um, everything else I just told you. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about death rattle. As you know, it's a naturally occurring upper airway sound from retained pharyngeal secretions because patients near death are no longer able to swallow, cough, or clear their throats. But the thing about death rattle is the little tiny bits of mucus or saliva make a lot of noise because the airway is a resonant tube. And so even small amounts of secretions will generate varying amounts of noise. So what is the prevalence? Two studies, mine and Heisler's studies, done at about the same time, followed patients who were close to death and we matched in terms of prevalence. So follow, following a sample of dying patients, about half of them developed death rattle. So who has distress from death rattle? Dr. Wee from the UK, who I see is on your uh, speaker panel for tomorrow, has done most of the work about death rattle distress and treatment. In one of her studies, she looked at bereaved relatives and half were distressed by the sound and half were either neutral or recognized it as a signal of impending death and it was helpful for them to gather when the person had death rattle to know that they could be present or nearby when the patient died. What surprised me about her second study, which was a qualitative study with hospice staff and volunteers, was most reported negative responses. And I found this very surprising because I would have thought that hospice staff and volunteers with their familiarity with this symptom would recognize that it doesn't cause patient distress. So I undertook a study because it had not been previously measured is does the patient have distress from death rattle? Shh, Dusty, not now. My cat decided to get under my desk and tell me she would like a snack. If you can hear my cat, I apologize. Um, so I did a prospective study of patients who were near death and once daily we assessed them for the presence of death rattle using a zero to three scale, absent, near the head, near the feet, 10 paces away. <clears throat> and then we also measured the respiratory distress observation scale. <coughs> and here's what we found. Half the patients had death rattle, half did not. They were matched in terms of gender, <coughs> ethnicity, and diagnoses. The only difference in the two groups was the presence of death rattle. The very bottom row is the respiratory distress observation scale, and they were in the mild to none 
range, and there was no difference in the two groups. <clears throat> so we concluded that perhaps pharmacologic treatments aren't indicated. These are the most common approaches to death, to death rattle treatment. In the US, transdermal scopolamine is the most commonly used. Um, atropine eye drops in the mouth, which I always wonder about those because they're not meant to be in the mouth, so I bet they don't taste good. Subcutaneous glycopyrrolate, which is commonly used in the anesthesia setting to dry the mouth before intubation. It's commonly used during endoscopy procedures when the tube is gonna go down the mouth to keep the mouth dry. And then there's also the no medication option. So which of these do you think has an evidence base? Let's see what happens. Nope, nope, nope. There we go, no medication. So doctor, we also did led a Cochrane review about interventions for noisy breathing in patients near death, looking at randomized controlled trials or controlled before after studies and studying the most common drugs. Got glycopyrrolate, scopolamine, and atropine. The important finding, no evidence that any of these interventions is superior to placebo. So my conclusion about death rattle is the effectiveness of medication is unlikely. So what can we do? We can put the patient on their side, put a towel over the pillow to catch any secretions that drool. We can advise listeners, and listeners could be our own staff, judging from Dr. Wee's study, hospice volunteers and hospice staff were disturbed by the sound. So the listener could be family, they could be staff, but advise them about naturalness and no patient distress. Furthermore, since medications have adverse effects, particularly glycopyrrolate with its profound mouth drying, and the patient can't report them. So I would suggest, and I, I feel real strongly about this, that medicating a patient to soothe family or staff is ethically problematic when there's no patient benefit to the medication. Now, one thing I've done in practice is normalize the sound when I'm talking to a patient's family. So this little cutie is gonna drink that chocolate milk and the glass is almost bigger than she is, but you know what's gonna happen when she gets to the bottom of that glass. She's gonna take that straw and chase those last few drops at the bottom of the glass. And the sound she makes is going to sound very much like the sound of some retained secretions in the pharynx. And so when I explain death rattle to a patient family member, I use this analogy. I say that that noise is the same noise as trying to get a little bit of milk out of the bottom of a glass. And when people realize that it's a little bit of mucus making a lot of noise and not needing to treat it. So in conclusion, I've talked to you about two respiratory symptoms. Dyspnea, which is very difficult to treat and has not the robust um, evidence base we would like to have. And death rattle, which is very easy to treat because no treatment is required. So with that, I hope I wasn't speaking too fast. I'm glad my cat decided not to stay under the desk meowing and I'm prepared to take questions. <laughs>